All right, so do you know what he ended up with? Uh, nothing. <laughs> now, let me tell you what he ended up with. He end, and please do this down, very important. So, systematic uh, what doubt. Was it? It's called systematic doubt, yeah? He ended up with something called the cogito. Now, I'll tell you what this cogito is. It's very important in philosophy. How do you spell that? C O G I T O, yeah? C O G I T O. It's very, very important in philosophy. It's one of the most popular concepts in all of philosophy. One of the most popular concepts in all of philosophy, right? He ended up with something called the cogito. What's it called? Cogito. Okay. Some say cogito. Some call it the cogito, but you know, cogito, yeah? What is the cogito? And remember, he, he now, he's doubting everything. He's, he's doubting his senses. He's doubting his faculties. He's doubting everything. After six chapters, he says, there's one thing I can't doubt. What do you think he said? I just doubt. <laughs> doubt. You're, you're definitely on the right tracks for sure. Mm. I exist nearly there, right? I am nearly there. It's present. I am who I am. He said, <laughs> you're, you're, you're definitely on the right track. <laughs> he said famously, I think. I think. Therefore, I am. I am. Okay? That's very famous. One of the most famous lines of all of philosophy. He says, I think. Therefore, I am. Okay? He said, I think. Therefore, I am. So what does that bring back to life all these five senses? Because it's like he's demantling it, and then all of a sudden he's saying, actually, I think, therefore I am. And if I am, I have to believe in my five senses. You know what he's doing? What? He's deconstructing and reconstructing. This is exactly what Salam is about. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they called him a rationalist. Yeah. Because he rationally broke it all down, and then he's building it up from the... From the so, so after that, he start trusting his five senses? Yes, afterwards he starts okay. trusting everything. He, he, believes in, he even believes in God. So he came back to his senses, basically. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, I think. Yeah. Right? Therefore, I am. Now, to be fair, some philosophers like Nietzsche, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but they even... Nietzsche... It's a very difficult word to spell. N-I-T-Z-S-H-E. He said, actually, he criticized this. He said, I presupposes the existence of yourself anyways. Yeah. So, but, yeah, so he, he, he created, I mean, by the way, it's not just me, just many people that said Oh, so science is what I'm talking about. No, he's, 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 he's the first person. Yeah, yeah, why did you create, presuppose an existence? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, do you know what you could refine this as? And yeah. this is just my little thing. Thought, therefore existence, yeah? Yeah. That's if you peel away everything. If you peel away everything, this is what ends up being uh, identifiable, yeah? From a rationalist perspective. Mm. But what have we done in doing so? What has René Descartes done in doing so? He has shown us that everything can be reasonably doubted. Okay, this is quite profound. René Descartes has shown us through his experiment that you can reasonably doubt, you can make a cogent and coherent and consistent case about the existence of everything, except for thought itself. That's where he stopped. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, doubts are a part of the world, and you can cast doubt to anything or anyone. Now, this is going to become very relevant when we talk about atheism. Mm. Because we say, we doubt God exists, we doubt this and we doubt that. Well, well yeah, hold on. Mm. You could doubt anything. We could, we, could do a René, we could do a systematic doubt experiment right here and right now. And if I'm convincing enough, I can make you doubt your five senses, right? Mm. And we're going to find out why these methods are uh, important. Uh, yeah, of course. So, this is obviously um, knowledge from within. That we yes, 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 yes. So can't we counter him by bringing in knowledge from outside? So if, for instance, for the five senses, yes. if we have like a, a vote again amongst everybody, 
Yeah, he would say that, look, the, the, five, the five senses are already in question. So okay. you can't, any knowledge you get from outside is, is not trustworthy. Yeah, so for example, you're saying, okay, let's use the pen. He's saying, I already doubt the pen. How are you using yeah. the pen when I doubt it itself? Yeah. The tool that you're using is in question, yeah. let alone using it. Perfect. Now, I, I don't want to take too much of uh, your time. I'm going to move on to something important, okay? So then... So Any then, questions? Yeah, go on. So, so then, that completely dispels the point of evidence. Yeah. No, but then the question now would be, what is, what is evidence? Yeah. And what is the evidence which we accept in order to come to conclusions of certainty? Because if, if we're saying that the evidence has to prove something to a degree of 100% and there is no leap of faith mm. anywhere, then we have a right to reasonably doubt our own existence. We do have a right to do that. True. So what I'm saying is that, and this is important, almost everything requires a leap of faith. This is the, this is the point I'm making. Mm. Let me say this one more time. Almost... Is this your statement, yeah? Yeah. Almost everything, and potentially from a rationalist perspective, what would we take out from that? What would be the, the notable exception from that? Thought. Thought. Because thought is there. Whether you like it or not, the fact that we're thinking, we might not be able to ascribe it to our first person selves, but it exists no matter what, yeah? So almost everything requires a leap of faith. Almost everything requires a leap of faith. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the Quran, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ The ones who believe in the unseen. Allah, he means the unseen that relates to the religious discourse. Heaven, mm. hell, all of these things. Mm. But wallahi, in another way, everyone believes in the unseen. Mm. And everyone believes in something they have not seen. And everyone is required to have faith. It's not a matter of faith. It's a matter of what you have faith mm. on, what you have faith in, even. yeah? Mm. So everyone has faith in something they don't see. Yeah. But it's not a matter of having faith in something you don't see. It's, about, it's a matter of what you have faith in, yeah, mm. and why. So this is really bringing it down to the lowest common multiple, okay? We're going to move on to... Uh, so that's interesting, just to emphasize on that yes, point. Yeah? So you're being, basically, in a nutshell, what you're yes. saying is, so for somebody to come and say, yeah, you must look at you, you believe in... Angels, ha ha ha. We, yeah. You're actually basically saying the last is on you because you're doing exactly the same thing with something that is not religious, maybe, Perfect. but something that is metaphysical. Excellent. And you're actually laughing at yourself. Excellent. Because you carry the same thing. It's just we believe in that. Excellent. So yeah. let's, let's, let's use that example and let's make it into a scientific example. You used the word at the beginning of this lesson because I think you made a good point there. So we want to just spend maybe two minutes expanding on that point, okay? Let's talk about the religious discourse, the discussion we have, the debate that we have, okay? People will say that. So someone, let me just pretend to be an atheist for a second. Say, look. Can we call you Mark? Oh, uh, no, because Mark is uh, it's a biblical name. So. Uh, How but, about... But the, but the, the, the Christians have a faith that it wasn't just a pen name, although we know mm. that it was. How about Timothy? Timothy's fine, okay. Let's, move <laughs> <laughs> let's say, for example, if I say, right? If I say, exactly the question you put to me, okay? Angels. Mm. Yeah, angels. How can you believe in the existence of angels? Isn't that hocus pocus? Isn't that mythology? What's, what's your response? I would say, for example, personally, I'd say you, you believe in something that's metaphysical as well. Give an example. So I would say uh, the conscious. Consciousness. How personally is the consciousness? Consciousness is good. So consciousness is experiential though. Can you experience angels? No, but then again, you're using your. So time. we've not seen. Not oh, 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 okay. Um, maths. Mathematics, we can. We, we once again, we can see it. Not in not in a physical sense. Not in a physical sense. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I saw the test. Yeah. yeah, you know because we've been through it, yeah. right? You know. I've learned this. You can't do it. No. Yeah. So, but, but, but we can kind of experiment with it, right? Mm. It's still intuitive knowledge, whereas angels are not intuitive knowledge. Yeah. So what you, what are you going to come to with, with now? You used it in the beginning of the session. Something about the atom. Oh, uh, matter. Something below the atom. What's Subatomic. It? Subatomic atoms. Yeah. This is a very interesting field. I don't want to go into too much detail, okay? Mm. So you remember the, the discussion you had with one of the people in the park, yeah? Yes. Alright, so... Double the, split experiment. The double split experiment. What do you remember about the double split experiment? 
So basically, what they do is they fire uh, particles okay. through this uh, stubble slip. Yes. Uh, so basically, uh, <laughs> no slip, yeah. Slip or slit? Oh, is it? I don't know. Slip. Don't know slip. Slip. It slips. Yeah, it slips. So basically, they fire these uh, particles through there. Yeah, yeah. And what they've noticed is that whenever they observe it, so they put something uh, there, a monitor, yeah. to observe it. Yeah. Whenever it's been, I'm saying, whenever it's been observed, yeah. it acts like a wave. Yes. And when it's not been observed, it acts like a particle. Okay, good. So what does that suggest? They suggested, this is what they came up with, by the way, that it's, uh, it has a will and it's making decisions. Yeah, okay, that's, that's speculation. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But we're asking the question. Yeah. It, it's, why have they come to that conclusion? Because they have no other. Exactly, because is, is it working in a logical way? Nope. This is important. Yeah. Listen carefully, put it down, put it down, yeah? Yes. Now, we're not going to become quantum physicists overnight, yeah? But this is one principle you need to learn, yeah. okay? Quantum physics yes. defy the law, laws of logic. So, for example, the fact that something can only be in one place at one time, for example, yeah? Or many different laws, like the level slit experiment, or whatever it may be, yeah? They defy the laws of logic, the law of contradiction, the law of this, the law of that. It may defy it. So, the way in which things work on a quantum level are illogical. In a, on a macro level. They're illogical. We don't understand them. Yes. yes. But then, are we, are we not assuming that the logic we have is universal? Yes, we are assuming that. Okay. Yeah, if we assume that the logic we have, the formal laws of logic that we have, is universal, then then we come to this problem of how comes it defy the law of logic? Yes. Okay, so what's what's important about this? How would you use this in your English discussion? That, for example... Do you ask him a question? It? Ask me a question about quantum physics first. Do you believe in... Do you believe in quantum physics? physics. Okay, I believe yeah. in quantum physics, yeah. Okay, do you realize that it defies uh, our basic logic? Okay, so what's what's important about that? Why is that relevant? It's, it's important because the thing is, it's the same argument that you're using against me when it comes to the issue of English. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, excellent. The only difference, there's actually only one difference. The only difference is that with angels, that we're using religious language. Yeah. Whereas with subatomic particles, we're using scientific language. Yeah. But in both cases, we can't see what we're talking about, mm. and we don't know why it's acting the way it's acting. And it's metaphysical. It and it's metaphysical. Okay? Okay. I'm going to put here schools of thought. Okay? Just like in anything, philosophy has schools of thought. Okay? So, there are three major schools of thought when it comes to understanding the reality around us. Or, in terms of acquiring knowledge, yeah? One of them is called materialism. And this is also called physicalism. The other one is called dualism. Which, by the way, Descartes, who we mentioned, he was a dualist. Okay, most philosophers probably fit in this category of dualism. Okay? And the third one <clears throat> is idealism. So we've got three schools of thought. We've got materialism, also called physicalism, dualism, and idealism. Okay. These are school, three schools of thought. Now, I'm going to quickly go over these, okay, with you guys, and explain them to you, alright? Materialists... Sorry, what was the third one? Idealists. Idealists. So it's like ideal and then... Or idealism is the name of the school. Okay? So you've got three schools of thought. Materialism... Believe, materialists believe in the follow, following. They believe that five, the five senses are the ultimate way Of understanding the world, yeah? Question. Okay, so as Muslims, we believe that Nabi Musa mm -hmm. split the sea in half. And this was witnessed by the children of Israel through their five senses. 
So um, if we don't experience this kind of event, then we're likely to doubt that this occurred. No, I'm, I'm, we're not saying that we, by the way, I'm not making a religious statement here, I'm just giving you the, we'll come to this point, yeah? But five senses are the ultimate way of understanding the world. And they'd go further than that. They would say anything untangible is meaningless. This formulation was put, <clears throat> this formulation was put by, uh, famously, by many people, including this guy called A.J. Ayer, in this country, who wrote a book in 1933 called Logic, Truth, and Language, okay? Logic, Truth, and Language. Now, Attached to this, he was something called a positivist, okay? And there are other people called positivists, which they are really, they are empiricists. Now, there are too many keywords here, so let's try and break them up, okay? Materialists are people who believe in what? Uh, uh, we'll use our five senses. So, so anything that is not from the five senses is? Meaningless. Okay. A positivist, I'm not going to define it now, okay? But it's usually someone who believes in a, a principle called the verification principle. Okay? So I'm going to put this down. Now, the verification principle, the verification principle states that if it cannot be verified scientifically, it's meaningless. meaningless. Who says, who says this? So, positivists say that? No, but you said you gave free here, materialism, Judaism, and idealism. We're just with materialism now, yeah? Oh, you saw materialism? Yeah, we're so, on materialism. So there's another branch called positivism? Yeah, so this is all underneath materialism. Oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. yeah? So materialists, you can't really be a materialist, uh, sorry, a positivist, unless you're a materialist. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Okay? So positivist. And physicalism is the same as this. So they believed in the verification principle. So anything which is not cannot be verified scientifically, yeah, it's meaningless. So that's what positivists think? Yes. Why do they use positive? What, what's the positive? What's the what does it mean? I don't know. Okay. To be honest. Okay. I don't know why they call them. If you don't use science as a means? Yeah, if, if you can't, I, if you can't verify it physically, yeah, it's, they say it's meaningless. What about, what about the past? Perfect. Excellent. Mm. So if you can't verify it with first person experience meaning, is that what they say? They didn't say anything about experience. They just said if you can't verify it scientifically, yeah, it's meaningless. So what did you ask? What about the past? Okay, what about the past? How can you how can you Your prove, great great grandparents? How can you prove the past exists? What else is problematic about this view? What other things can we not So prove? for example the Big Bang theory? Okay, no, it's not the Big Bang theory. Evolution. You could say the past, like you said, historical yeah. events, yeah? But there's something more glaringly obvious which we actually talked about in the beginning of the session. Math. Mathematics. Yes. Mathematics. Forget, forget in the past, you can't, you can't do it now. You can't even <laughs> verify mathematics. So then, it's, it's, um, it's a contradictory... So, so basically, they have to go back to the Stone Ages and just live like that because they can't use maths. Well, they wouldn't say they can't use maths, they just they can't they can't verify it. Yeah, but so then how, they're saying it's meaningless. How could you use something meaningless to <laughs> Yeah, it's meaningless. Then then why do you know what else do you know what else is meaningless then? Ethics. Morals. You know why? Yeah. Because it's unverifiable. Yeah, exactly. Ethics and morals are so put this down please. With for positivists, yeah. ethics ethics, history or the or the past even, yeah? Mathematics, what else have we got? We've got the scientific method itself. Because the scientific method is a is a step-by-step -step method which is metaphysical. It's nothing to do with science. Yeah. So what yeah. if you're a positivist that's conformed to like a messed up society that does a messed up thing? That's the thing. Historically what happened is in the 1920s and 30s, yeah? Very important history, and I want you to remember this, okay? 
In the 1920s and 30s, let's, let's hope it's not. In the 1920s and 30s, put it that, 1920s and 30s, there were two uh, very important philosophical circles. Okay, one of them was called the Vienna Circle. The Vienna Circle, because it was in Vienna. And the other one was called the Berlin Circle. There were circles, like we have like a little circle here. The only difference was, obviously, they had major philosophers, great minds, and they were all positivists. So, what was it? Vienna? The Vienna Circle. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was like a, it was a halakha, yeah? They used to go and they used to meet each other, yeah? And they used to debate. But they used to be united in, in that they were positivists. Okay. So, positivism became very strong. Became very strong in 1920s and 30s. And you know why it was so popular? One of the reasons, socially, is because it denied all of metaphysics. It denied metaphysics. Mm. Which means, by necessity, it had to deny what? Mm -hmm. God. God. Yeah. yeah? And not only God, it denied? Morality. Morality and? Ethics. Ethics and? Maths. And maths and religion, yeah? So, they, they, they thought they found the, the missing puzzle, yeah? Mm. Seriously, this was... In philosophy, they thought they had found a way to do away with God and consider him meaningless, common sense, non-commonsensical, yeah. irrational, yeah? yeah? But then, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, people were asking the questions, how, how can you verify the past? How can you verify mathematics? How can you verify this? How can you verify ethics? How can you verify morality? They, be they became bombarded with these questions. And they quickly realized they could not answer those questions. Mm. And they tried to change verificationism, this whole idea, into weak and strong verificationism. That's what Ayer did in his book. He had weak and strong verification. Mm. But in reality, you could say, you could argue, that verificationism was killed off as a philosophical concept. Mm. It's very rarely that in philosophy, yeah, that concepts are killed off. People just kind of put them into the dustbin of tried ideas. And this is what happened. So this idea of verificationism is still now in the dustbin yeah, of tried ideas, yet materialism is a very strong school of thought. So materialism, some people say that everything that exists is all that we have. But despite that fact, positivism, which is, remember we said it's like a sub-branch, that's gone now. It's, it's weak, it's dead. No one argues like that, no more. So with the material, uh, materialist full power in, yes. if something illogical comes to you, and it can be, it falls under the, if everything that exists yes. is what we believe in. Yes. What if what if an angel comes to you? Would, is that something you'd believe? Or yeah, uh, they say that becomes physical now, isn't it? So but yeah, it depends on how. So they how can you brush something off that you have an experience? No, but the experience for them is a is a problem, right? Yeah. First person experience for materialists is, is a big problem because yeah. they can't explain it. They try and explain it through a new neurology, which we'll come to later yeah. in the lessons. But it's a very 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 big problem. Okay. So, now you have to identify, if you're speaking to an atheist, now let's bring it back to discourse, mm. religious discourse. If you're speaking to an atheist, you must identify quickly if that atheist is a materialist or not. Mm. Because if you identify that that atheist is a materialist, you're going to start bombarding them with questions they will have no answer for. Do you know how I know they have no answer? Mm. Because for hundreds of years, no philosopher has ever had an answer. So it's very unlikely, if not impossible, for that person to have any convincing, truthful, meaningful answer at that point. So as soon as they're saying that we don't believe in anything except for that which is extrapolated from the five senses, what would you say to them? What about what? What about angels? What about God? No, forget about God and angels. They, they say we don't believe in God and angels. They're the atheists. Okay, what about mathematics? What about maths? Mathematics. What about what about metaphysics. Oh. metaphysics. Morals. But they're morals, ethics. Okay. Good. Now we're on the right path, yeah? Okay, excellent. Now, so that's materialism. We don't have to deal with, inshallah, materialists. Okay. I'm quickly going to mention dualists. But this is going to move on to our next lesson, okay? Because the question we're going to ask in the next lesson is what are minds? Now, put that question in your mind for now. Let it kind of ferment in your brain. We're going to come to it. What are minds? But dualists believe that there is a mind-body separation, okay? That basically, we have, the world is composed of minds and bodies. 
So you have minds and you have bodies. Does that make sense? That's what they believe the world was made up of. Okay? Now, idealists, and we said someone like Rene Descartes was a Jewess. Idealists believe that actually all we have is minds. All we have is mind, and that really and truly, everything we perceive is a mental construct. Now, I know this is, some people say that there's a bit more to idealism than that, but generally speaking, that's how people identify idealism. Everything is a mental construct. That's what they say. And there's one of the main guys that um, Russell uses to reference, and a guy called Bishop Berkeley. You can put his name down. He was an idealist. There's another Berkeley, George Berkeley, but Bishop Berkeley is usually referenced, okay? So idealists believe that everything around us, we're in a matrix world. Okay, so is it, how do we put it? We're in a matrix world. Okay, matrix. Okay, excellent. Now, these are the schools uh, of thought. That will conclude. Okay, inshallah. That will conclude. Idealism, you said idealism. Yes, but that is idealism. Um, idealism is dualism. What dualism? Dualism is you have your mind and you have your body. Two things. So these are separate. That's separate. Minds and bodies are separate. And, uh, and you have idealists. We believe that everything is a mental construct. Everything is perceived. Everything is in the brain. You could, some of them say that nothing actually physically exists. So they're the opposite of materialists. So um, how can they agree with each other? Because to me, if I'm an yeah. idealist, I'm a person... Well, that's the point. They don't agree with each other. Okay. They disagree with each other. Okay. So um, that's the point, right? Sometimes you'll find... So then how can they disagree with each other? Well, they disagree with each other because they have different conceptions of how, yeah? the, how knowledge is acquired. Remember... But then, you know, for instance, if Ali is just a mental, mental construct, so how can I, as, a, as an idealist, have a conversation with him and disagree or agree? Because he's just... These are good knowledge. questions. I'm not saying they're bad questions. They're good questions, but that's something when we'll get into idealism a little bit further, we'll, we will discuss. These are three schools of thought. We just need to know what they're about, okay? We'll, we'll put the flesh on the bone in lessons to come, inshallah. These are good questions, all right? Any questions at the end? Brothers and sisters, Jazakum Allah Khairan for watching. Hopefully, you've benefited from this. Until next time, you can join us at Critical Thinking and make sure you like and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.